John Walton. He's uh, working at Microsoft, and he again is going to talk about security and cloud computing. Great. Thank you very much. Everybody, hear me all right? So, um, as you mentioned, my name is uh, John Walton. I usually get uh, one of two questions whenever somebody finds out my name is John Walton. Uh, it's usually either A, how closely are you related to the Walton family that started Walmart? Like Sam Walton, the answer is not close enough. Or two, um, I see some folks old enough in the audience may remember the, uh, the show The Waltons, and yeah, definitely do get called John Boy quite a bit. So. So let's uh, talk a little bit about me, other than the fact that uh, some people call me John Boy. I work at Microsoft today, and I manage a security team that's responsible for um, software plus services. However, prior to joining Microsoft, I started my own company doing uh, security consulting, uh, basically worked with a lot of financial verticals to cover just various security topics from network security all the way up to application level security. And then prior to that, I worked for a company called Avaya. Over here, it's uh, called Bosch Telecom. And I did a lot of voice over IP security for them as well. So pleasure to be talking to you guys here today. So let's talk a little bit about um, kind of the basis of this talk and where my experience and a lot of um, the stories I'm going to tell you later on in the presentation kind of derive from. Um, so Microsoft is, you know, like many companies, we actually are in cloud computing, as you saw Kurt talk about earlier. Um, cloud computing is definitely the new wave. And Microsoft's offering here is really, you know, from a business perspective, is the Microsoft Online Services, and I've got some of the products that, that uh, we have up there. But there are many other companies like Google and IBM, Amazon was mentioned in Kurt's talk that are also uh, have a number of offerings. So, you know, what I'm going to tell you about today is really what I've learned in the last three years and what my team's learned, uh, trying to build trustworthy services and some of the things that, uh, you know, you should keep in mind as you're looking at uh, services, either from a security perspective or, as, as Kurt mentioned, you know, maybe uh, from a business perspective, utilizing them. But uh, Microsoft Online Services is, is the first, uh, you know, portfolio of a Software Plus services. And I'll tell you the difference between Software Plus services and cloud computing a little later. Um, but it's a subscription-based service for businesses. It's hosted in Microsoft data centers. It's very common for other companies like Google to have their own data centers around the world as well. Um, and they'll host those uh, services there. Um, the development models for Software Plus services actually vary, which is kind of interesting. We found a, a lot of you know, differences in the security processes uh, when you're developing a product that, say, ships every two years versus you know, Software Plus services that may have releases happening on a very regular basis, sometimes even on a monthly basis. Um, and things change when that occurs. So what does Software Plus services mean? Um, we need to answer that question first, and as, as those have done research or have read a lot of the marketing speak, you'll see all kinds of different terms for that. Uh, I'm going to try to simplify that for us today when we get started. It's basically a best of breed things. Um, you get a rich user experience, you get you know, sometimes uh, offline access, so it's not just your service only um, offerings, you actually can utilize your client bits um, that you're already familiar with. All your data is always available. You saw that in Kurt's talk. And of course, um, folks that uh, run IT departments, you know, security guys, that's one that kind of hits us and says, hey, do I really want all my data always available? Um, so that's certainly one that sticks out to a lot of people. Form factors, you know, you can access these things over, um, over the web using your browsers. You can also access them over mobile devices, uh, which is very common. The last bullet, the last uh, latest version always being available, you'll hear that commonly touted as, a, as you know, an advantage of Software Plus services or, or um, online services. And that's kind of true. I'll tell you about that a little bit today, too. But the main thing is that the IT experience for manageability, compliance, all of that rests you know, in this one offering. That you heard um, Kurt talk about the economies of skill or the economies of scale. That's definitely true in these kind of offerings. Um, but it, it leads to this agility. And uh, so if we kind of step back and we look at what is cloud computing, cloud computing is really a general term. And it can mean many things to many different peoples. So um, on the bottom, you can see that IASS, or infrastructure as a service, is really about you know, having the ability to you know, offer that networking capability. Um, these are usually built on a power or storage um, or an infrastructure basis. The run on a time environment is really there for like putting virtual servers on there or putting actual operating systems on top of that. You know, it's generally built on a per hourly basis or, or gigabytes um, bandwidth or, or storage there as well. 
If you step up one layer, you actually have the platform as a service. And uh, we'll give some examples of what actually falls in here. But platform as a service is really, you know, again, you know, one layer above the infrastructure, you're actually going to have, you know, your, your access to the platform itself. Um, then you step up one more layer beyond that, you have software as a service. And um, that's usually built on a per user per month basis. Um, that's really where the end users are accessing. Now the difference between software plus services and SASS, or SAAS, excuse me, is really about taking advantage of the existing software you already have installed on your systems and then connecting that to your services. So again, it's not just an online offering. You don't just access things over the web. You may um, utilize your existing software and then connect with that. So that's the difference from a strategy perspective. If we actually take a look at some of the services stack here, in the infrastructure services, some examples there, we have Amazon EC squared. We have Rackspace. Those are very uh, popular um, infrastructure as a service offerings. Uh, the platform services, you have Amazon S3. You've got Salesforce. Uh, Windows Azure falls into that. And of course, the Google App Engine falls there as well. Um, for the platform services, it's really force.com, but they're, they're owned by Salesforce and as part of their offering. And of course, if we go up into the software as a service layer, the application stack, you have Google Apps, you have Salesforce.com, and then you've got uh, Microsoft Online Services as well. But there really are a couple different slices of uh, Software Plus services or software as a service offerings. You can have consumer-based services. Those aren't new. We've actually had seen those for many years. Uh, you've got things like Windows Live Messenger, ICQ, you name it. There's been tons and tons of consumer-based services available uh, for many years now. The difference between those and a business service is that an IT generalist or an IT uh, guy isn't involved in that. So you know, if you remember Frank from the last uh, presentation, he's not involved in, in purchasing or even utilizing those services necessarily. Um, his end users just go and, and um, they try to use them. Now he has to manage that and maybe become part of his network or his infrastructure, um, but uh, he's generally not involved in, in acquiring those technologies. They usually don't have a service level agreement, so no guarantees there. The revenue is generally ad-based, um, and of course from a Microsoft perspective, that's the Windows Live brand that you see for the consumer services. For the business class services, the differences there are pretty obvious. The IT generalist does procure those. He buys them for his organization. They usually do have service level agreements. Most commonly, you'll find uh, three and nines uh, for service level agreements. And they require a lot more enterprise grade security, right? And they require a lot more reliability because the business is making a bet on um, that kind of class of service. And of course, the, you have the subscription based services on a per user or per month basis that we saw earlier. If you look at the business class services, you actually will find two different offerings. Uh, they'll either be dedicated services or shared services. Now, another way that uh, you'll hear that ter term called is like a private cloud for the dedicated service or a public cloud for the shared service. The dedicated service is really, you know, you're buying a set of systems or hardware that's dedicated just to you. So if you're Acme.com, you're going to get a set of um, infrastructure and, and hardware that's specific for Acme.com, and they're separated from, say, Contoso.com. The data is, of course, physically separated at that point. You have a lot more customization there. So if you want to say, you know, like, you know, this kind of operating system, I would like this kind of features enabled in my applications. Generally, that's uh, something that you can select when you're buying those kind of services. But of course, there's a higher cost for that. In the shared service environment, you're actually a, a shared multi-tenant environment. So Acme and Contoso may actually be running on the same um, set of uh, infrastructure, maybe the same set of platform, and possibly even the same uh, service itself. The data, of course, at that point is logically separated instead of physically. Uh, and then you have limited customizations because the customizations would affect um, the rest of the tenants on that same uh, set of systems. And, and of course, you get a lower cost for that. So at this point, let's talk about the security side of things. And I'm going to kind of tell you a little bit about our experiences um, at Microsoft and, and kind of tell you what we've learned over the years uh, from doing that. But this is one of my favorite uh, quotes from a vice president of ours actually in, in the Microsoft Online Services division, is that the hardest part, you know, according to customers um, and according to our VP, is establishing trust. It goes back to that, you know, Frank needs to trust his business partners. Um, things. So this is really what uh, you know our job is from a security perspective, um, regardless of whether we're building software or we're building software plus uh, services. And of course, things like you know outages um, that every single company that offers services has ever had, 
you know, um, you'll find articles about outages, and so that's, uh, you know, certainly damaging one's reputa reputation and um, the ability to establish that trust. But let me step back here a little bit more and talk about how the, when you build software plus services or when you build software as a service, how that differs from building traditional box product, you know, software, and it'll actually demonstrate some of the issues that uh, folks will run into there. So in the traditional software market, generally people are familiar with the waterfall or spiral development models. Um, they will be used to these long release cycles, multi-year release cycles. Um, the patches are generally pulled from the clients. Uh, you have a lot of heavy activity from a security perspective. Maybe you actually perform stand downs uh, and you do security reviews you know, for multiple weeks and you look for issues at that point. Um, the software, of course, does run on the end user's system or on a server in the enterprise uh, from a business perspective. But again, it's always on premise there. Whereas with S plus S development, you actually have generally what's called the agile development models. And I say agile in quotes because there is an actual agile process. You know, Scrum may be a, a term you're familiar with. And some companies will utilize, you know, the actual agile development process, or really it's just some kind of combination thereof, their traditional software development life cycles and, and you know, some kind of agile process. So when I use the term agile, what I really mean by that is that it's a you know, fast-paced release cycle, that these things need to be flexible, that um, you're going to constantly be pushing out new updates or, or bits out um, to the system a lot quicker than you're used to today. And that has some advantages and disadvantages. But your changes generally are incremental, so you may not have one really big release where you have, you know, tons and tons of features going in. You may actually have a release that has one feature and the next release has another feature uh, and so forth. So that means that your security activities have to be very agile as well. So that's one of the things that uh, we learned at Microsoft very quickly on when we were doing uh, Software Plus services is that we had to change the way that we did our security activities to make them flexible, to make them uh, you know, kind of follow with this, this agile process. And of course, with uh, Software Plus services, you have software running on the end user system. You have you know, maybe software running on the enterprise uh, servers, but those are generally connected or um, have some kind of feature capability with uh, a hosted service that's um, not on-premise for you. So some of the advantages of the Software Plus Services um, method or the Agile development cycle is that frequent updates are expected. So you actually start to learn that process, and, and because you're constantly making changes, you're, you're able to sometimes push out changes quicker than you might have been if you were using your traditional development models. If you have emerging threats, those are generally easier to um, fix. And what I mean by that is folks that are familiar with some of the old, you know, buffer overflow attacks and Microsoft had to make, you know, architectural level changes, you know, um, in some of their systems and provided like um, data execution prevention, ALSLR, all those kind of things. They really, they had to put those into a major release and that was a service pack release. You may recall Windows XP service pack 2 had a lot of those changes. But because that was major changes, um, to deal with those emerging threats sometimes, uh, it took longer to uh, push those updates out. Whereas in the Agile development model and with services, because you, know, you may have uh, more control over the, the software that runs in the hosted environment, you may actually be able to mitigate issues um, you know, quicker than you would uh, in a traditional life cycle. In addition, you're able to actually respond to things in bits versus bytes, as I call it. What that means is that you may not have the full end-to-end -end solution for a particular problem that you're dealing with, whether that be security or not. You can make changes that incrementally help uh, improve the system or protect the system from attacks, either as they're occurring or, or as new threats emerge uh, as well. And so that's kind of a big benefit for us, too. Uh, you can stage mitigation. So you can actually you know, try the mitigation and, and see if it's working. Uh, and if it's not, you can learn from that and you know, plan your next step a, a little bit better. One of the problems with uh, traditional software development and changes is that you have this back compat problem. You generally are dealing with uh, lots of older versions. You know, you may have to support versions that are five years old, and you have to you have very much um, more variability on the systems that you have to run on. Take like your your um, standard patch from almost any company. They have to support many different hardware versions. They have to support a lot of different um, you know compatibility things between software and between versions. And so in the software plus services realm, especially on the services that uh, or the, the software that's running inside the hosted environment, you have less availability there. Generally, your hardware is, is pretty much standard across um, your entire deployment. And um, you don't have that many versions running there, usually maybe N minus one versions. And because of that, you don't have as much to test. 
right? And so that's also an advantage from a services perspective is that you don't have you know, as much uh, testing needs there and you don't have to worry about the back compat. And of course I mentioned the, earlier in the presentation that the latest version is always available. And I called that partially a myth and, and I, I named that for a couple of different reasons. <clears throat> if you've ever had to run an IT environment, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you know that it takes time to actually push out patches and sometimes you have to stage those patches and you have to roll them out over many weeks, maybe many months, depending on your business because you don't want outages and you have to plan for those outages. The same thing's true in Software Plus services or any kind of SAS offering. Uh, so it's important that um, you, know, you kind of keep that in mind. The, the business, of course, is going to try to protect themselves. The service providers are going to protect them, themselves as uh, much as they can. And of course, the latest version always, all, always being available means that uh, you don't have to support as many versions back. But of course, customers sometimes are resistant to um, upgrade to the next version. You know, maybe they have to train their new organization, their organization for the new version, and, and so they may resist that um, upgrade for a while. And of course, that requires the service provider to uh, maintain or support those uh, versions going back as well. So let's talk a little bit about, from the security perspective, some of the things that uh, you need to keep in mind. Um, you know, as you're either developing services or maybe as you're utilizing services from different uh, companies. Basically, I think of islands of opportunity as being the security experts, right? It's a very important for organizations, um, if they can afford it, to hire security experts. And if you're going to, whether you're going to be developing um, a service or whether you're actually going to be utilizing a service, here's some recommendations that I have for you. First of all, you need to have some kind of development process. Like Microsoft, we have the secure development lifecycle. Um, make sure that uh, all of your engineers are utilizing that, that they're familiar with it, and that just becomes start of the, uh, part of the standard process. And if you need to modify that you know, system or, or engineering procedures to accommodate for these new agile development models, then do that. Um, at Microsoft, we had to create the agile uh, SDL in order to accommodate that. Two, the security engineers really should be doing, performing a lot of research. Because uh, cloud computing or services is a new technology, it, from a business perspective at least, it's very new, um, it's important to understand what those risks are going to be. And so from, within my team, a lot of uh, the security research that we've been doing has been paying off um, as we you know, consider adopting new technology and want to protect our customers as well. Three, manual security code reviews are very important. Um, a lot of companies are getting a lot better about their development life cycles. They have things like the SDL. They may also have uh, a great set of tools like we do at Microsoft um, for you know, protecting the software that we build and finding issues as, as we find them. But those tools are still not necessarily mature enough for especially when you enter into a new technology like cloud computing. So it's extremely important um, to offset that with manual code reviews and use those manual code reviews to actually you know, understand how you may need to change your process, understand what additional tools uh, that you may need. Um, so that's been uh, very useful for us. Of course, penetration testing uh, is very important as well. Also paying off, same set of things, you know, find new issues that uh, maybe your existing tools don't today um, or your process doesn't find. And of course, try to feed all of that back into the organization. So, you know, my team's really responsible for supporting engineering. And it's very critical for us to take the lessons that we've learned and try to, you know, feed that back in so that we don't uh, continue to make any of the same mistakes that we made, made in the last uh, milestone or release as well. Now, I'm not just saying that for job security, and I'm, I'm sure all folks in this room are like, all right, great, we have security folks here, and, you know, he's telling people that they should hire them, that's good. I really mean that, and we actually do have some positions open, so I figured since I had an opportunity to talk here, I'd at least mention that. Um, let me talk to the security professionals in the room directly for a moment here in this presentation. I see a lot of security folks really thinking that you know, their job is to uh, just raise the flag all the time, warn people about issues, and that's where their job ends, and unfortunately, I think that's a mistake. So I'm going to talk to those in the room that actually perform security engineering or security consultants, uh, you know, what have you. I really want to encourage folks, um, you know, as a profession, we need to start maturing here. And what I would ask folks to do is really strive to kind of put yourself out of a job. And I mean that seriously, because there's never any lack of new technology um, for you to focus on in the future, so you really won't ever put yourself out of the job. Um, it's important not only to find issues, but to identify fixes for those issues. And, and for the folks that you're working with, um, you know, propose solutions, become part of that solution rather than part of the problem. 
um, and you'll find that people are generally a lot more willing to work with you, um, and they'll be, you'll become more valuable from an organizational perspective. Um, so you won't be seen just as a tax. And of course, learn to fight the right battles. Um, you know, as you find issues, make sure that uh, you know you prioritize them for whoever that you're working with. Whether that be an engineering organization, whether that be an IT organization, you know, it, it really um, doesn't matter. Just make sure that you're fighting the right battles. Um, it's just a lesson that we've learned. Now, a poll that I often give people, and I'm going to you know give this audience, is how many people think that security engineers should be able to stop a product from shipping? Kind of want to see some hands. Wow, full of marketing people in here. It's pretty good though. So thanks for uh, raising your hands. I actually gave you know this talk to uh, this portion of the talk to two different you know segments one time. One to the the managers of an organization, and I saw almost no hands raised, and I gave it to a bunch of security engineers, and all of them raised their hands because they thought uh, they should be able to stop our product from shipping because that kind of excites some of us sometimes. Um, so let me tell you a little bit of, about um, you know kind of a story where we actually had this happen in our organization. We were working on a product that um, was one of our first software plus services offering. And throughout that entire development life cycle, we actually had worked with uh, the, the engineering organization. They were following um, the security practices uh, to the letter. They were actually going above and beyond in many cases. Um, so we were finding that they were an excellent partner to work with. Uh, they recognized the importance of security and they were trying to do as much as they could, especially since they were a first um, offering there. Well, unfortunately, about a month before we were to ship this product, due to ship this product, we identified a vulnerability um, which affected the service. And it was kind of a new type of vulnerability in the sense of you know, it wasn't just like a vulnerability in the client, it wasn't just a vulnerability in the online service. It turned out uh, the change was late integration uh, based, but um, as this change was pushed out to the online service, it would actually, you know, uh, push data down to the client, which was running on the end user system, and that would affect their browser security settings. And of course, then um, when they changed the browser security settings, you were affecting the security of every uh, website that you were visiting. So it was a pretty big deal to us. Um, well, what we learned from that is that, uh, one, you know, <laughs> good fortune never uh, eludes people, but, you know, this kind always caught us, right? As we were just about to ship the product, we were kind of, you can imagine us riding this big wave, we were about to ship in a month, and, you know, we are just kind of buttoning down the hatches on the system, and whew, late, last minute change, we find a vulnerability. Um, the good news of, of the story is that we actually had a system in place to uh, deal with this kind of issue late in the game. We had put together a process that said, okay, if we find a vulnerability just before we ship, we know exactly who to escalate to. Uh, we know the bar that we need to um, rate things against to identify whether it would be a ship stopper. Um, we even took this process and said, okay, what if we ship and said, we find a vulnerability right after we ship or soon after we ship, how are we going to deal with that? And that process helped us immensely because we were able to, you know, put that process in place, just assuming the possibility of that happening, we were able to deal with the issue a lot more uh, quickly than we would have if we hadn't had that process in place. And the great news behind that is we actually did stop shipping uh, the product for a month. We, we delayed the shipping, excuse me, for a month until we could go back, address the issue, and then do some investigation to make sure that we didn't have any of those kind of issues in the future. Um, what was kind of neat about this is that we were able to quickly realize the security engineering re return on your investment. Earlier in the presentation, I mentioned it's important to have security engineers you know, or experts working on, on the system if you can. And in this case, uh, it was actually the security engineer that found it in a pre-production environment. You know, he was doing his penetration testing in that environment because it was the main environment where things come together um, and actually are working as one. And so that's the area that you want to test with if you can. And of course, it illuminated a new kind of risk, you know, where a, a change on the service may actually impact um, the actual client machines as well. Uh, that was important. And then we tested our process that we had um, actually put in place, which is also great. And of course, from that, we identified a number of changes that needed to happen. We needed tools to actually prevent this kind of issue in the future. We needed to be able to not depend solely on a manual process or, or a set of people to identify these issues. We want to actually prevent this automatically. Um, and of course, um, that came with education as well to make sure that folks making those kind of changes understand the impacts that they're having. So as we move on to, into the next story that uh, I have, we actually had a product that was acquired. And uh, it was a software plus service offering as well. Um, and the problem we, we ran into there is really, you know, 
was really basically a cross-site scripting vulnerability. And for those uh, that are in the room, you know there's two ways to protect those. One is um, you can protect that through input filtering, input validation. The other way is to actually encode the output uh, to make sure that uh, the data that's entered as input isn't treated as code on the other end. And so, you know, this organization, before they were acquired by um, our company, was actually, you know, familiar a little bit with, uh, familiar with cross-site scripting, and they decided to prevent uh, those issues through output encoding. Well, what we found when we were actually doing uh, manual code reviews and penetration testing is that we're able to find cross-site scripting vulnerabilities even though their threat models and you know, their developers had, had thought of these things and tried to protect against them. But um, you know, every security engineer that followed up on the product would find another vulnerability. And that sort of led us to go, OK, what's wrong with this situation? Why is it that you know, every time we take a look at this particular product, we find new sets of vulnerabilities or you know, same vulnerabilities? And what we learned is that, you know, first of all, we needed to improve our testing techniques. And what I mean by that is, if you're familiar with you know, these web applications and cross-site scripting, you know, most people test these by just simply hitting every page and every parameter on, on the web you know, application. But in Software Plus services, the systems are a lot more complex. And so it may be that before a page or a parameter is available, you actually need to use some kind of feature in the web application. Or maybe you need to use a feature in coordination with a feature on the client end. And because of that, um, certain pages or parameters wouldn't actually light up until you did that. And so we actually had to improve our testing techniques. Um, secondly, we found that, uh, again, the manual code reviews were extremely valuable. As we identified, hey, this is an issue, let's go back to the code that we have access to and try to identify these issues uh, before they go out the door. And we learned a very, very valuable lesson here, which is defense in depth. You know, most security professionals realize that that's important, but your engineers may not. And so it's extremely important to remember that you know, if you have a vulnerability that has multiple mitigations, it's often best to use um, those multiple mitigations because you know, if you have one that falls down or one that's not implemented, you're hoping that the other mitigation uh, will protect against um, those kind of issues. So in this case, what we did is we uh, took a look at the product and we said, hey, let's uh, start fixing the missing output encoding cases. And since it's a service and we're agile and we're constantly making changes to the system, let's uh, roll those changes out as we find them. And so basically fix the issues as we find them. Meanwhile, let's work on the longer term solution, which is to re-architect the protection or the security mitigations here. And let's implement an additional defense mechanism on top of output encoding and do input filtering and validation and try to protect against that as well. Um, so that was something we did there too. So as security engineers, we often hear you know, excuses for why uh, vulnerabilities aren't fixed. And this is, of course, you know, one of my favorite excuses. Every company I've ever worked at, I hear somebody give me this excuse that, hey, that uh, particular security bug has been there for years. We're probably safe. It's not a problem. Um, and I really, it, it, I'm sure most of you probably drives you nuts as well. Um, so, you know, what what I recommend to folks is respond with a, a very light toned, uh, you know, tradition response, which is just because you've always done it that way, it doesn't mean it's not incredibly stupid. And what I mean by that is, you know, think about how things could be exploited and, you know, deal with those uh, misconceptions that folks may have about, you know, a bug being there for a long time and, and why it's important. Um, in one case, we actually had a, a, a development organization that kind of gave us the following answers. Nobody's ever exploited that. And since we actually run the services, uh, they're hosted in our data centers and we operate them, if they had exploited it, we'd know about it. Uh, this is a common misconception, unfortunately, with uh, a lot of folks that are new to services. And I want to dispel that uh, misconception as, as much as I can. So s what we ended up doing with this particular organization is we, we wanted to ask the question, OK, if nobody's like, ever exploited this, how do we really know that? And if they have exploited it, how can we be certain that, they actually, uh, that we would catch it or that our operations uh, counterparts would actually catch this? So we took uh, these particular set of vulnerabilities. They were blended threats. They weren't you know, just one-off vulnerabilities. You actually had to combine multiple vulnerabilities in order to, to really gain access, um, any you know, level, significant level of access to the system. And we actually tried it out on the organization. We decided that, hey, let's, uh, let's try to exploit our own organizations and see what happens. You know, it, it was a good way to develop proof of concepts, and when you actually uh, need to do that, uh, feel free to use that, utilize that resources, make sure you have sufficient buy-off on that. But um, it's great, actually, to exercise not only those exploit skills that 
you know, our hackers and the people we're defending against um, have, but it's also important to test you know, those assumptions that nobody's ever exploited that or an assumption that hey, if they had, we'd know about it to see if the operations uh, folks did. In this particular case, we were able to get away with it for quite a while and we used that in our training um, to that organization. We actually you know, popped up screenshots of their uh, systems and their data you know, internally showing, hey, we had access to the system, we've been accessing it for months and you know, maybe nobody noticed that. Of course, that followed with how do we, do, how do we protect that so that um, in the future we do know about it. So that kind of leads to my, one of my favorite uh, screenshots is, you know, exploiting your coworkers can be fun and it, it can be the right thing to do, um, you know, given, given sufficient buy-off on that, so. Um, with that, you know, let me tell you a little about some of the risks that Software Plus services are actually going to have. These are common risks that I've seen uh, and that my team has actually experienced as we try to develop uh, trustworthy services. Multi-tenancy is a really big thing. Uh, Multi-tenancy meaning you actually have more than one tenant running on the same system, at possibly at the same time, is gonna actually develop new security threats. A lot of the companies that are actually doing services are taking their existing products that weren't designed for you know, this uh, multi-tenant environment and they're utilizing that to have a multi-tenant offering and because of that, there are gonna be new types of vulnerabilities. Um, there. there are going to be new threats as well. Remember earlier I mentioned this vulnerability or threat that we had, you know, changes to the service ended up impacting uh, the client itself. You know, that's a new type of threat. You're going to see a lot of performance and scalability demands that you hadn't seen if you were developing just traditional box products or products that run in the enterprise. You know, you still, performance was important then, but when you actually have multiple tenants and you have you know, these service level agreements where if you go down, you actually have to pay your customers. Uh, performance, scalability, reliability become far more important than they had in the past. You also deal with software only assumptions. Assumptions where, you know, they were assuming that uh, the client bits or the end user were connecting within the enterprise to the software. Um, and now when you actually take that and you connect over the internet um, to access data or access, uh, you know, the application, you're gonna have, um, you know, the previous assumptions that, that weren't correct. And of course, uh, a lot of online services or software plus services offering allow users to upload content. And what we're seeing a lot of uh, times in, in our research as well as, um, you know, in our reviews is this hosting of untrusted content can become a real problem, especially when you have multiple tenants on the same system. Um, so it's very important to uh, deal with that. <coughs> so in the next story, I'm gonna tell you actually kind of, uh, demonstrates some of these issues. So we had a product that you know, wasn't designed for the online service, and uh, you know, that particular product, um, when it was getting enabled for an online service or a software plus servicing offering, we realized that, hey, you know, it may have dealt with multi-tenancy from a user perspective. It's used to having you know, multiple users from the same company connecting, but it's not necessarily um, the case where you have different users from different companies connecting to the same system, or a case where you actually have different administrators all affecting the same system. So a lot of these uh, software plus servicing offers have the notion of an administrator's take exchange online or SharePoint online. Um, and previously when those products were designed, they were designed for a single administrator or a set of administrators that all belong to the same organization. And of course, in a multi-tenant environment or a shared offering, that's not the case, right? You actually have, you know, an administrator of Contoso.com, an administrator of Acme.com, um, and you have new types of issues there. So what we ended up uh, doing was we, we did some research to identify whether there were a previous set of bugs that, you know, had been punted or, or um, won't fixed, if you will, because they assumed, hey, it's an administrator uh, from the same company that would, that would be able to do this. So we went actually back through the old features and through the old bug database and their threat models. And any time we saw an assumption or a bug getting punted or won't fix because you know, somebody said, well, an administrator of Acme.com could do this to another administrator of Acme.com, but that's like hanging you know, another member of your own organization or maybe that's like shooting yourself in the foot. So that's maybe not critical enough uh, security vulnerability to fix. And what we found is that there was actually a set of bugs there that in this new scenario, in this new uh, world that we live in, they actually become issues because it's now not, you know, administrator of Acme shooting himself in the foot, he's shooting, you know, the administrator of Contoso in the foot, and that becomes a problem. 
So we actually try to deal with those kind of things um, you know, at design time and, and make sure that the new products that we're building and the new features that we're building actually have this service-oriented architecture that they understand that there are new threats associated with that and we have to account for those. Um, and that really brings us to you know, my next point, which is change. Um, you know, winds of change, are they blow hard enough. Those trivial things where an administrator could do something to themselves now become deadly projectiles when they actually can uh, affect other users on the same system. So, but change is good, right? Uh, cloud computing, software plus services, there are actually a lot of advantages as I talked about earlier. Uh, keep in mind though that you need to do valuable bug scrubs. You actually need to make sure that you understand your new scenarios and how those previous assumptions may affect you. Again, multi-tenancy is extremely important. Um, try to deal with this service-oriented architecture. If you're, you're building new products or products that even you don't think may be enabled for uh, cloud computing, keep in mind that someday someone may take that and actually put it online um, and there will be new threats associated with that. So some of the other challenges that I'm not going to cover today, um, but I wanted to at least leave you with, is that uh, change control is a necessary evil. Because you're going to be making changes more often, more commonly, you know, these quick release cycles, you actually have to have a change control process in place. So you need to make sure that the sufficient design reviews or code reviews um, or approval levels are actually in place before you put the bits out into the hosting environment. Because uh, you don't want to affect customers or SLAs or any of your security at that point. Late integrations are something to watch out for. Um, as things kind of come together, it's usually late in the game because these development life cycles are quick. So again, earlier I mentioned when you're, if you're gonna do penetration testing um, and you're part of an organization building a service, try to do that, that testing or that penetration testing either in pre-production or if you have to, in production uh, environments so you make sure you actually test um, the real world scenarios. Release tracking is very important. So a lot of times for uh, services, you're actually gonna have multiple releases going on at the same time. And so uh, what we found is actually having a tracking process in place and having somebody dedicated towards that uh, to make sure all the checks and, um, you know, are written and you know, all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted, um, that becomes very important. Because these releases are very fast, it becomes even more important. So try to take these manual processes you know, that you have and automate them as much as possible um, that pay, it'll pay off uh, 10 times fold every time. Some of the other challenges that I actually hear when I talk to customers, uh, and I'm sure you know, at the end of this presentation I'd love to hear um, you know, questions and stuff about this, but some of the most common uh, things that I hear from customers about, hey, I, wanna, you know, I, I understand what cloud computing is, but you know, I'm a little bit concerned about moving to it. You know, how do I know that I can trust you? How do I know that um, you know, I can still maintain control of, of the data? Somebody earlier asked a question in, in Kurt's presentation. You know, if the co company goes under or you know, if I need to get access to my data, you know, I don't control it at that point. It's actually hosted somewhere else. How do I get that? That's a very common question. We often get questions about where's my data located? You know, that's important for, for customers to ask as well. And most of these companies you know, have data centers around the world. So um, you may have some choice as to where your, your uh, data is located. Um, and over time, we're gonna continue, continue to see these data centers you know, pop up in many different locations around the world, so you'll have even more uh, flexibility there as well. Of course, you'll have backups too between systems, so keep that in mind. Uh, generally, with a lot of the service providers, they'll have you know, a primary data center and a backup data center. Um, they are generally trying to keep them you know, geographically located, uh, not only from a bandwidth perspective, but just from the legal um, you know, perspective as well, uh, to keep that data, you know, say, in the same country or in the same um, region of countries as well. But these are challenges that, that you should think about and um, you know, ask as you uh, look into cloud computing and software plus services. Um, a lot of uh, companies as well, because it's hard to establish this trust, and I mentioned that as our VPs, um, you know, most commonly asked question, I get that question a lot. Um, I think it's important for, for companies to go out and do what you know, we're doing is try to talk about, here's some of the issues that we've run, run into, here's how we've dealt with them. I think that goes towards this trust relationship. Uh, the second thing is a lot of companies are also, you know, having external companies come in and validate their processes or validate their offerings. Uh, so you have a lot of security consulting companies maybe rubber stamping uh, the offering. I had, you know, we had heard a question earlier um, that, uh, you know, how do we make sure that you have, you know, the right up to the patch level and whatnot. Some providers will offer the, the right to audit. That's something you should ask them. You know, do they provide the right to audit? And, you know, is that something you can do? And if they don't, 
do they have any external third-party validation um, for their systems? And that's another way that um, you can be more confident that, uh, that your data is protected as well. Um, with that, I'm just going to leave you with uh, one of my favorite slides for um, you know, what is software plus services. And uh, I encourage folks to uh, either look into it or you know, consider that for certain you know, parts of your business or certain data, uh, it may be the right solution for you. And uh, you know, just consider your options and uh, go with the best ones there. That, one last final note that we do have some job openings, and I'd love to talk to people about that. Um, I'm constantly looking, and I'll, I'll take some questions at this point. So. Thank you. Are there any questions? Would you raise your hand if you have a question? Wow. You Stunning covered pretty silence, much I guess. all I don't the know. details, yeah. <laughs> um, seriously, no one with a question. And I'm going to ask you just a very odd other question. Um, sure. Which is, um, I'm sure you've heard about a paper that came out like a couple of months ago by students from the MIT and the California Univers uh, University of California um, about physical security in the cloud and how um, all these threats that we've seen and that we take into account if we make a decision on whether to move to a cloud computing environment or not. Um, there is the possibility of mapping out, of, of making the cartography of where specific services of a company or the company service itself are hosted, like mm -hmm. the, loca the location, and uh, then trying to set up another server, um, another service of the malicious attacker basically on the same server as to get the advantage for uh, side channel attacks, for instance, um, denial of service attacks, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. Could you probably elaborate a little bit about these concerns? Yeah, so that, that uh, paper actually that you're describing was pretty fascinating. Um, basically, these two researchers had uh, you know, found out that some of these companies, usually their infrastructure providers or platform providers, you know, assume or claim maybe that um, your data can move around. It could be anywhere um, in data centers around the world, and you really don't have any idea where that may be the case. Uh, they actually demonstrated through this research paper that you know they could identify uh, where the data was stored, and then of course um, you know target those specific locations as well. And I think that that's a really good lesson for a lot of service providers, uh, and not only that, um, you know, IT generalists who are procuring these services to keep in mind that um, anytime somebody claims that you know, your data could be located in any world and, and that's a security uh, advantage, you know, that's really just security by obscurity. So um, you know, assume that, uh, that a, a user will actually be able to um, you know, access your data and figure out where that data may be. Um, and, and you should rely on other security mechanisms to make sure that the serv service provider actually assumes that um, you know, that's the case and they have uh, other security mechanisms in place uh, to prevent that. So I think that's a good lesson learned. Um, from a denial of service perspective, I think that's really you know, kind of an interesting question. A lot of, a lot of people ask me you know, this question about, what about you know, denial of service? And I think what's interesting there is that with these business class services, you have a service level agreement. So if you end up getting affected by a denial of service you know, because the service provider goes out or maybe the, you know, they're targeted or your specific instance of the service is targeted and, and you have some kind of outage, they're going to end up paying you back for that. Right? And in today's world, you know, that's, denial of service is a threat to any organization. Uh, so what's kind of interesting is I kind of flip that around on people and say, hey, what if you had a denial of service today where you're running that in your enterprise? You know, whether that be a malicious attack or maybe you just have some kind of hardware outage or um, you know, what have you, you end up having to spend additional resources to address that. Whereas in the, the software plus services or software as a service offering, you're not the one spending resources for that. It's a service provider. And on top of that, if you have an outage, you're going to get some kind of reimbursement for that if they have a service level agreement it's within, that, uh, within that agreement as well. So it, it turns out those kind of things can be you know, an advantage of why you might want to move to a software plus services offering. Um, the other thing that I often tell people uh, is, you know, what do you, where do you store your money? You talk about like data privacy and trust, and you know, it, it's a service provider has that. Money's the same way, right? How many of us actually store our money at home under our mattress or in the closet? You know, not very many, right? And the reason for that is that uh, 
we can be certain that we're protecting our, our uh, assets or our money that way. So we go to somebody who's better at that, these economies of skill, and we use banks. You know, and That might be not a great example given this economy sometimes, but, uh, but traditionally banks are more secure. They can actually uh, protect your assets a little better than you might be able to at home. And so software plus services can be very attractive to especially the smaller businesses where they don't have security expertise and they don't have the luxury of, of spending uh, money on hiring those security expertise. So they have to rely on service providers to actually um, do that for them. And because those service providers are providing lots and lots of customers with that, they may actually have the resources to hire skilled folks um, to do that as well. So that's also another reason to, to possibly go that route as well. But again, um, as, as Kurt mentioned earlier, the answer is yes and no. Uh, you really have to look at a case-by-case -case basis. You have to you know, do a risk management, understand what data you're willing to, to uh, part with and kind of you know, allow a service provider to establish that trust with and, and make sure that they protect that. Ask the right questions. Um, I, you know, as a security expert, I love to hear those kind of questions and I, it drives change within organizations. Um, and so it's great, ask those questions, but uh, keep in mind for certain, you know, segments and certain um, scenarios, your, your best bet might be the service offerings. That was a long answer to your question, I think. Thank you very <laughs> much. <laughs> Any more questions? No, everyone is tired. Okay, thank you so much, John Walton. Thanks, and guys. we're going into a short coffee break until 4 p.m. See you then. Thank you.